Hi, my name is Steve Carroll. I'm the dev manager for the Visual C++ team. And we're here with Going Native number 53. Today we're here to talk to you about multi-threading. And this is an episode, sometimes we do stuff that's about the product, sometimes we do stuff about what's new and interesting and exciting in the committee. Today we just want to talk about the libraries themselves and how you know a regular programmer can use them to just write more correct and efficient multi-threaded code. And welcome to Going Native 53. My name is Steve Carroll, and today we've got Stefan T. Lavoate, and today a new uh, member of our happy team, Billy O'Neill. Uh, so I guess let's everybody should know who you are, right? You're you're Stefan. Surprisingly, not everybody does. I had a guy on Reddit saying, "Hey, you know who are you?" So we added user flair to the CPP. Is that why that is there? Yeah, because yeah, they were like, "I have no idea who you are, other than that you work for Microsoft." So, so. I've like all sorts of different possible introductions for you. Like my, my favorite is like like if you look in the dictionary under nominative determinism. <laughs> there we go. Yes. I am STL. I work on the STL. Yes. Okay, <laughs> Billy. So so who are you, Billy? So I uh, came from security land and semi recently joined the Visual C++ team about... On the uh, side of light or dark? Um, <laughs> it varies by day. I had to think you know. about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess August, about last August. So uh, I guess almost exactly a year now. But you were a good security guy, not a bad security guy. Oh, that's what you meant. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, well, both is Again, the right he has answer. to consider the answer. If, if you work on fuzzers, you're really working on both. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so welcome to the only the light side then. That's, yes. that's great. IO streams is certainly dark. I mean, there's some dark side <laughs> in there. Yes. Okay, so it depends is the is the short answer. Yes. Okay, so in prepping for this one, we were going through sort of like the going native archives and, and looking for things that we thought were valuable or that people like watched a lot of or that we thought were cool that were sort of wanted to re get people to look at again. And we found Stefan's um, series on intro to STL, right? And so it was like STL1, advanced STL, and, mm -hmm. and C++ basics. So we're definitely going to have links uh, below so that you can go and take a look at those things. So really today, I think we want to talk to people who are um, you know, like users of the STL. This isn't the, going to be the advanced uh, library writers and template metaprogrammer uh, fanboy kind of uh, thing. It's more of a <laughs> like very practical how to use STL. This isn't going to be uh, Microsoft specific at all. It's going to be like what can you do with the STL. So what we wanted to do is go through and talk about um, things that have happened in the language. Because when did we make those? Uh, it was like 2011, a little afterwards, like 2013 or so, when we were adding lots of new features um, from CS plus 11 and edging into CS plus 14 a little. Right. So the idea here is what has changed even since then that we didn't cover so that we kind of bring that material up to date and kind of introduce a new area. And so today I think we want to mostly talk about multi-threading because there's nothing in that series about that. And yeah, we, I was kind of scared of it at the <laughs> beginning and not really familiar with it. And I was like, I need to understand this stuff before I tell people how it works. Whereas with IO streams, I just hated it so much. I never talked about IO streams in those videos. Right. But I actually, I don't hate multi-threading and now we're actually quite familiar right. with it. And, and so basically what you're saying is, and there will not be a forthcoming episode on IO streams. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Probably not, unless they just rip it out of the standard, and then I'll have an episode celebrating. Like, I see. I see. Yay. Yes, we'll eat a cake on, on, on screen yes. for that. Uh, all right. We would need James here for that episode. Yes. That would be wonderful. OK. Um, so let's get started. Let's talk about multi-threading. So it seems like the most basic of types for this would be the going out on a limb thread. Yes. There's a whole header for it, too. Yes. So. There is a type called thread, and it handles all of the, um, so like every operating system API on the face of the earth has, like you can pass one pointer to your thread. And, and it's got to be a void pointer. Type. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's, it's completely untyped and everything. And std thread, the, the built-in type, uh, the type that was added in C++11, um, lets you pass arbitrary arguments and deals with the handing that over yeah. for you. Not only does it wrap the difference between like the POSIX threads API and the Windows or CRT begin thread EX. Yes. Um, and it allows you to pass arguments to your function. Um, it also allows you to have stateful function objects. So yes. it can be a lambda with data members. It can be your own class. It could be just a, yes. um, it uses the invoke protocol, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, so you could give it a member function pointer if you wanted, because yes. invoke is awesome. Yeah. Cool. All right, so is that all we want to say about threads? And we want to move on to like, what do we want to do with those threads now? Yeah. Well, I mean, the interesting thing about thread is there's some people who say, oh, yeah, you know, you should never use thread. You should always use higher level APIs. But the whole reason that the thread header and the std thread class are in the standard 
um, is because it is the most fundamental building block. Sometimes, yes. especially if you're writing something like a thread pool yourself, um, you want to say, I actually need something that is a hardware thread. And stood thread, it's not guaranteed to be, but the standard strongly suggests, I'm actually going to give you a hardware thread. And we try yep. very hard. On, on our implementation, it is. Yeah. So, got it. So now I've got threads. So now I got problems. Yeah, you got data races. Now I got data races. Yes. <laughs> so what do I do about those? Um, well, you have mutexes, condition variables, and atomics. Okay, so I've got future, a whole bunch you know? of vocabulary that I can use here to do this. So yes. I, I think what we want to do here is sort of help people understand, like, you know, use this one or use that one, or what what are the applications? So, ninety-nine percent of the time, you just want to use a mutex. Like, take take the data that you want to access from multiple threads and make sure that you've locked the mutex before you access that. Yeah, and it, this is something that um, newcomers to multi-threaded programming often miss, is you need to ensure that every access to your shared data is protected by that mutex. You can't say, oh, I'm going to have thread one and two write to it holding the mutex, but thread three can just read normally. No, it's like if any multiple threads are parting on this data, all reads and all writes must go through that mutex unless you have very special guarantees, like. Before you spin up any threads, of course, you can have ordinary reads and writes. But as soon as you could have any other thread in there, um, between a synchronization point, you need to protect the thing mm -hmm. with the mutex. So in some ways, this is like the, the, the introductory guide to this thing is, once you've got threads, unless you know what you're doing, yes. and are really sure you know what you're doing, because experts get this stuff wrong all the time, yes. you want just mutexes and protect all writes and all reads. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so then what later you can think about how to increase performance by using more fine grained mutexes or maybe using atomics or restructuring your code um, for other, you know, um, potentially just not sharing data in the first place um, can be very fast. And hopefully you're not even doing that until you've proven that you actually have a problem of yeah. some sort. Yes. Yes. I guess it should be noted that unless you have a correct single threaded program, trying to write a correct multi threaded program afterwards is an exercise in pain. <laughs> and madness. Yes. OK, so um, I think one of the nice things about doing this in C++, perhaps, instead of other, other languages, is that RAII is a thing. Yeah. Right? Yes. And that cleans up code quite, quite a bit. Yeah, you get deterministic construction and destructions. You don't need to worry about, oh, my object's holding a lock, and then when it's destroyed, you know, it's going to get rid of the lock. But because the garbage collector is doing finalization, I don't know when that's going to happen. With C++, it's like, I'm going to tell you when that destruction is going to happen. Um, so you don't need to worry about leaking locks or anything like that. So I guess the, the other part of the if you don't know what you're doing, what do you start with is don't, so the, the standard has mutexes and locks. And everybody uses these words interchangeably. But in the standard, um, mutexes are the thing you use to synchronize access with your data. And locks are the, um, the thing that you should use to talk to mutexes. They're what you create on the stack, I guess, um, that calls lock and unlock for you and calls unlock and the destructor. So yeah, they're purely helpers. They don't do anything really of themselves. Yes. You got your lock guard, which can't even be like a reset. The lock guard just in its constructor calls dot lock on a mutex, and its destructor calls dot unlock. So you can't forget, because it would be very bad. The scenario is you lock a mutex by calling dot lock manually, but what if you throw an exception? Ha ha, then you've you know, unwound and you don't even have that mutex anymore. You never get unlocked. Right. And you're back in bad. Billy's land of pain. Yeah. Land, land of pain. pain. <laughs> right. Whereas if you use a lock guard, then the guard part of it says, hey, you know, no matter how you return from this scope, whether a return or a throw, you're going to get rid of the thing. Then you got your unique lock, which allows you to actually move, the, uh, move that lock that it owns. Um, but it's really just sort of a bool or a pointer. It's very simple. Sometimes. Uh, it looks nice to use a unique lock just because you know you want to drop the lock earlier in your function, but actually it ends up being a lot easier to analyze if you just use lock guard and create empty scopes in your function. Just yeah, like like, like create cr like just like add braces and the the first statement of the brace chunk make your lock guard, and then the closing brace is the is the unlock the mutex now. Yeah. Thing. Although the one reason to use unique lock is you need to use it with condition variable, which yes. means to acquire 
But we'll condition. get to condition variable in a minute. Yes. So in the meantime, though, by simply putting those braces in there and creating one of these sort of stack-based objects like lock guard, et cetera, mm -hmm. um, if something crazy happens, like an exception gets thrown, then the compiler does the hard job yes. of making sure that it gets yeah. cleaned up. Yes. Especially if you're acquiring multiple locks in a row, for example. It'll get rid of all of them. So basically, and in the right order. Yeah. And then the rule is basically any direct call to dot lock or dot unlock on a mutex is wrong. Like, don't <laughs> do it. It's yes. bad, as bad as saying new manually. Very, very scary. OK. Um, all right. So I think that covers threads, basic mutexes, and locks. Yes. Yeah. Let's get into atomics. Yeah. So mm -hmm. one of the things that people are very confused about, also because Microsoft contributed this back in the bad old days, is some people <laughs> thought, oh, yeah, you know, volatile is just going to make all your multi-threading problems go away. Um, and the especially bad part is that other languages, like I think C Sharp and Java, actually yeah. do grant multi-threading semantics to volatile. C++ is not one of those languages. Um, volatile is not a multi-threading primitive. Never use it to create multi-threading correctness. Uh, Microsoft's got these non-standard guarantees in our compiler that, yeah, it grants acquire release semantics to volatile. Um, but they actually turn out, out to be extremely problematic because that's not actually sufficient for correctness for some algorithms. Right. And it's expensive on ARM and ARM32. And again, if you're trying to get towards more cross-platform code. Yeah, you don't, don't even have don't those guarantees. So that. just never say volatile for multi-threading. Just put it out of your mind. Volatile is like for low-level hardware access, and that's it. Um, instead, and atomics are what you want to use if you don't want to require a lock. OK. And give me an example of when I would want to use an, an atomic, but not instead of the lock. What's the, what's the like sort of canonical? Um, the canonical case is what shared putter does um, for reference counting. So just to increment a reference count and decrement a reference right. count, you don't want to take a lock, touch the reference count, and drop the lock when you can do that in one, C one Especially underlying if the lock CPU is relatively contended, right? Yes. Like basically, you've got a very simple variable. It's going to like increment or decrement. Yes. And you, and you don't want to have a big, fat, heavy lock around it. Yes. Yeah. It turns out Although that the Although locks can be surprisingly fast. Um, yeah. Like, at, before you go breaking out atomics, like profile your code and make sure that it matters. <laughs> yeah, atomics, they're nice because they do map to the hardware, because the hardware has the ability to do like an atomic increment or decrement of a variable. Yes. Um, but if you need to do any, you know, higher level thing, like if you're thinking, oh, I can write, you know, a lock free singly linked list or something, don't do that. Just yes. using your text. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Got it. All right. So, atomics. Any tri tips or tricks for, you know, mistakes people make or. You know how to use them well is it as simple as simply labeling the thing as atomic and moving on with your life. Um, the two common mistakes are using more than one atomic and getting confused when when thinking that oh I edited these two Don't atomic have things and so that's atomic. No, it's only atomics are only atomic for the individual atomic thing. Yeah. So you, can't, is, you can't assume consistency across the two of them? Is that what we're getting at? Or uh, is it? You can assume consistency in that within a thread, if you do three things in order, those th three things will happen in order. But mm -hmm. if another thread is doing the same thing, you can have like the first thing on one thread, the first thing on the second thread, and then the second thing on the second thread before yeah. the second thing on the first thread executes. By default, what atomics give you is what's known as sequentially consistent execution, which is actually the model that programmers can reason about saying right. that the operations of all threads occur as if they happen in some interleaved order. Um, but threads um, don't view other threads' actions as occurring in different orders. Okay. Um, you can get that if you use weaker than sequential consistency, which is super duper expert level. And Herb has a talk about that. That's atomic right. weapons. Yes. <laughs> atomic <laughs> weapons. That's good. It gives you a nice emotional context in which yes. to see what and you're going to be doing. It's an accurate emotional spec. context. <laughs> yes. But even with uh, sequential consistency, the moment you start saying, I'm going to use two atomics to communicate between, variable, uh, between threads, um, you've got problems. Because then you need to worry about what states they can be in. Um, if you use a single atomic for communication, you can usually reason about that and what's happening in the code around it. But as soon as you start having two atomics, at that point, you should probably be thinking about using a mutex. Got it. Um, right. So it's basically, and, and again, we're in fallback to mutex if using it beyond the more narrow scenario of, I've got a number. It's got to be yes. updated across threads. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. The other common mistake is uh, using atomics with condition variables. But that's, um, we should probably talk about yeah, condition mixing, variables first. Basically, mixing atomics with any other form of synchronization is, in general, a bad idea, although yes. I have an example where I actually do get away with it. <laughs> um, but that's because it's not actually being used for communicating actions. It's just yes. communicating information. 
All right, so let's talk about condition variables so we can we can do the the mm -hmm. side by side on those. Okay, uh, so condition variable is kind of like an event. Um, well, what's an event? I assume I don't know so, anything. Okay, sure. Which I did like well, five years basically, ago. it's a it's a way of saying I have this thread and I want this thread to go to sleep and wait for some other thread to do, to do something. Yeah. But that reminds me to mention, sleep is not a synchronization primitive. Sometimes in beginning code, I'll see people saying, you know, sleep 1,000 you know, milliseconds or something. No, don't do that. Like, sleep <laughs> is never good for synchronization. In inserting sleeps does not make a program more correct. It doesn't Sometimes make it more can make efficient. them slower. Yeah, I would certainly do that. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. You don't use sleep. Condition variables, the way for a thread to say, hey, I want something to be true. Like, I need this vector to be empty or full. Um, and it's not yet, and some other thread needs to make that happen. So I'm going to you know, not be scheduled until this condition happens, hence the name condition variable. And you need to yes. use it with a mutex. They work sort of hand in hand. Yes. So basically, you just you give a condition variable a mutex and say, I'm going to sleep. Uh, and the condition variable atomically unlocks the mutex and goes to sleep on the condition variable. And then some other thread later, can call notify, basically, and say, oh, if there are threads waiting on this, wake them up, please, and let them go check this condition. Um, yeah, okay. condition variables can be tricky because of what's known as spurious wake-ups, or the condition being satisfied even before you go to sleep. Um, but the standard condition variable has what's known as predicate weights that actually make it very convenient, and you don't need to worry about these issues. Much. Yeah, much. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have an, uh, an example. This is code that I wrote at home uh, years ago, which I can show. It actually uses a boost condition variable in Atomic, um, but the semantics are the same as the standard one. Um, and it implements a uh, single uh, two threads, one producer, one consumer, okay. um, that uses a mutex and a condition variable to synchronize access to a vector, which okay. otherwise you could not have two threads like partying on a vector. That would be super data race city. Um, but with a mutex and a condition variable, it can be safe. So, so should I think about condition variables being sort of like the canonical way to, if you need to do a producer-consumer model, which is, I think, common in all sorts of different... Yes, condition variable is an important fundamental part of that. Um, whether it's single producer, single consumer, or something more fancy, like multi-producer, multi-consumer, um, condition variable is the way that you get other threads to wait on something you're about to do without, like, spinning. Because you could sure. certainly say, grab the mutex, you know, see if anything is there, oh, it's not there, uh, you know, release the mutex and then go sleep for a thousand milliseconds. But that's super dumb. That's pulling and spinning, and <laughs> yeah. it's going to burn your laptop's CPU, battery. CPU, yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Do we want to look at the code then? Uh, yeah. Let's do that. Okay. So I've brought up uh, that code that I wrote at home years ago. Uh, that's using a boost thread, boost atomic, and boost mutex. But all of this would map over to using std thread. Um, I've got it on the laptop here, so we can look. But we'll be putting it on the screen and making it available for you. It's just going to be one source file. It won't actually compile for you, uh, but you'll be able to see what I'm doing and what a producer consumer queue that is correct um, looks like. So first I'm looking at our data members of a local struct class that I've got here. Um, and the critical bits are that this is in a game engine. And I've spun up, um, you know, I've got a main thread doing stuff, and then I've got a worker thread. And the idea is I want the user to be able to hit a screenshot key. And I want to be able to capture the pixels on the screen. Um, and I've got to do that on the main thread. That's unavoidable. Then right. I want to ship that data off to the worker thread, just a bunch of pixels uncompressed, and tell the worker Big thread. Big old buffer. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And I want to compress that, um, which is a CPU intensive operation, and then scribble it to the disk, which could be a very slow operation, um, and not block the main thread during any of that. And I want to be able to hammer the screenshot key as much as possible, um, and only block the main thread for as long as necessary to capture to those take pixels. The buffer. Um, so here I actually am spinning up just one single thread because I don't want like futures or anything. I don't actually want to use all the cores on my machine. I want to, you know, partition off one core and say this core is for screenshots. Everything else is for the game. So that's why I'm using a thread manually, and I'm using um, a producer-consumer queue so that the main thread can produce these um, vectors of unsigned cares, which is just the raw pixel data, and then the worker thread will consume it. Um, so that's what these uh, data members here are doing. I've got the thread for the worker thread. I've got, and then I've named things shared. This is just my personal quirk. When I've got multiple threads looking at something, um, I need a mutex and a condition variable, which are inherently shared. And then the one thing that is protected is this m shared work. Um, and that's a typed up here for a vector of vectors of unsigned care 8 bit. Um, so I can store Which multiple screenshots. The, the, the screen yeah, exactly. Spectrum. A single vector of unsigned care is pixel data, and I've got multiple possible uh, frames waiting to be compressed. Um, so what I do here is next, let's look 
at the member functions above. I'm in Notepad here, so it's a little slow. Um, there's you know, some stuff around here about pixel buffer objects, but the crucial member function here is called send work. Um, send work is, it's actually one of the very few templates in my code, but only because I can call it with zero one arguments. Um, and the pattern looks like, um, just like Billy described, um, you need a mutex and a condition variable working hand in hand. So the pattern that you do is you use one of these unique lock helper objects um, to acquire the mutex. This is essentially saying mutex.lock uh, on this thing called mshared mutex. And the name is a complete misnomer now that an actual shared mutex type has been voted into the standard. In my defense, I wrote this like five years ago before that was even a thing. Um, now I would not call it. All right, it so what would it, it be? Mutex. Okay, so I would just call it, you know, M mutex that multiple threads can use. Whatever. Right, and anywhere you see boost colon colon, just in yeah, your it head, substitute it instead. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this says dot lock. So now I can access my my vector M shared work without the fear that all the Safe other line. threads will be messing with it. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to in place, but basically a pushback of this inside args, this uh, frame of screenshot data that needs to be compressed. So I'm going to append that to the vector. Um, and the idea is that if the user is hammering the screenshot key, they may be able to add multiple screenshots before they can all be drained. Um, and what I'm going to do is I've got a little twist on the producer-consumer queue. Instead of always pushing one thing and then popping only one thing at a time, I can repeatedly in place as many things as the user is hammering. And then when the worker is ready, um, they will actually take all of the pending screenshots and then drain them one by one. Um, so I only need to basically kick the worker thread and say, hey, wake up, um, if this vector was empty to begin with. Um, if it was not empty to begin with, then it knows basically the structure of my code guarantees that it is going to be notified. Um, so I only need to notify it if the vector was empty to begin with. Got it. Um, and that point for efficiency, what I do is this is, um, this is not necessary for correctness. Um, but I always point out in code reviews, I, I think I've said this to Billy a couple times, um, you don't actually need to be holding the mutex when you send a notification to your condition variable. It's actually faster to unlock the mutex beforehand, so if the condition variable is immediately ready to wake up, it can grab that mutex again. Um, so I unlock manually this unique lock, and then I say, OK, if I needed to notify the thing, call notify1 on the condition variable. Um, so this basically says, at a high level, grab the mutex so no other threads can interfere. Um, I know I need to tell the worker thread to wake up if there was no data in this vector to begin with. If it was, I don't need to tell it to wake up because it's already going to wake up. Um, I only need to tell it to wake up when it transitions from the empty state to the non-empty state. Got it. Then no matter what, add the screenshot to the vector, release my mutex, and then I can say... So the in place back is the add. Yeah, the in place back is the add. Then I release my mutex with the ul.unlock. Um, and then if I needed to deliver a notification, um, even though I'm not holding the mutex, the condition variable is safe to deliver notifications um, for multiple threads. So I can say notify one. There's also um, notify all Which is all the signal, function. basically. Yeah, that's a signal. Um, and notify, but not a signal signal like an exception. It's just a communicating yes. to the worker. Um, although the one thing I will say about moving notify one outside the mutex, yeah. in this algorithm, that is true. There, there are algorithms where you do need to hold the mutex when calling notify. Yeah. But they, whenever you write one of these from scratch, you actually need to think about it real hard, even though it's only yes. like a dozen lines. I thought super hard before writing this. Yes. Um, or so if you don't want to say, if you don't want to think super hard, then yeah. you just use the mutex and lock everything. Yeah. <laughs> you can go inside the mutex. It's always correct to do so. Um, but in, occasionally, it can be more efficient to notify us. Right. Yes. Um, then the other part of it is I've got a member function worker thread that's called only on this worker thread. Um, so okay. it begins that by other function was only called on the main UI yes, thread, the thread where you're thread taking the screenshots. Yeah, send work over. And now this is um, the, the, the consumer. consumer. Side. Yes. Okay. And I could have called it, you know, consume or whatever, but I just called it work yep. over thread. Um, so first this figures out, you know, what file name to write, highest number screenshot. And then it's got a loop. And it's uh, because I said is it's Is that like consume. an atomic then or is it? No, no um, this highest number screenshot, this is just an ordinary unsigned 32. I do have an atomic, but that's elsewhere. Okay. I'll show you what that is. Um, I, I did say I was doing one tricky thing here where I do mix a mutex and a condition variable with an atomic. Um, but it's actually OK, and I'll show you why. Um, so what this loop does is this makes one of these uh, vectors um, of vectors of unsigned care called local work. Mm -hmm. And the idea is it's going to grab the mutex um, with this unique clock. OK. Then I know I mentioned predicate weights earlier. I wrote this code so long ago, I didn't know about that. Um, so I actually use an ordinary weight here. I should not have done that. I've, I was being a bad kitty. Uh, <laughs> I should be a good kitty here. Um, and I should be using a predicate weight. The way to write that would be tell the condition variable weight on this unique lock until the condition uh, expressed by this lambda is true. And I would have said, 
wait until M shared work is not empty. Um, instead, I wrote it with a manual loop, which is still correct, and it's actually what the predicate wait would do. Um, it's just not really ideal. Um, so, so now you and, the, and the reason you need this loop is because uh, condition variables are allowed to spuriously wake. So, yeah. if the condition variable spuriously wakes, then you could check. M, you could assume that M shared work had contents, but it wouldn't have contents. Yeah. Basically, if you say plain wait with a unique lock on a condition variable, that can actually return even if nobody notified you. Yes. Um, you actually need to check, oh, was the condition actually okay. satisfied? And then condition is expressed And that's by. just something about how condition variables semantics yeah, are. Yeah, it's an yes. operating system. It, it seems, condition variables seem awfully strange, but it turns out that very smart threading experts have sort of converged on this is the interface, the minimum interface that you need for correct semantics in these Modern operating systems. And it, it's, this is true across POSIX and Windows. Yes. Every operating system comes to this conclusion that, yeah, spurious wakeups are sort of a natural consequence. So if you yes. don't want to worry about spurious wakeups, use the predicate wait form that you pass a lambda. Don't be like me here where I wrote an explicit loop. Got it. Um, you, you can, but it's not a good idea. Yeah. Um, and, it's it, more and it should be case. noted that during wait, the lock is released. Yeah. And then the lock is reacquired before wait returns. Yeah. The, the semantics are you grab this lock to say, OK, now I can actually look at. Um, whatever data signals the condition to be true. In this case, I'm looking at a vector, but it could be a bool, it could be an integer, it could be an integer that you're waiting to increment to a multiple of 10 or whatever. You, the programmer, get to decide what counts as the condition being ready. Um, and then if you do a predicate wait, you give a lambda that reads, and it's just an ordinary read of this ordinary data you have, but you're guaranteed that it's only going to execute when you're holding that mutex. Um, and then the Condition variable would say, OK, I'm going to give up the mutex so that another thread can actually grab it and make the condition true. Like the uh, main thread here can fill the queue uh, with screenshots. Um, and then when it's notified, the condition variable will grab the mutex again so nobody can be messing with the vector. Then your lambda will look at the vector, say, hey, this thing is not empty. There's screenshots to process. And then the weight returns, and you're left holding the mutex. So now you can operate on your vector. Right. And that's what this is doing. It's like a whole bunch of semantics packed into just a single function call. It's very strange the first time you see it. It took me so long to understand how this works, which is why I want to present this example um, so that you can sort of get up to speed a little faster. Um, so once we. Um, return from this predicate wait, which I would have written if I knew better, um, or this loop here. Well, maybe we can, um, when we give them the version, yeah, we, we can give them like both versions. Yeah, like, I just, I hate old, code, which might not be as wise Stefan, yeah. later <laughs> super wise Stefan <laughs> version. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so what I do is, because I'm working with a mutex, I don't want to be like actually processing the screenshot while I'm holding the mutex. Like the main thread wants right. to be able to get in there and fill the Then you'd stuff. effectively be blocking the UI yeah, thread. Yeah, that would be silly. Um, if so, somebody hit the button. So what I do is I'm trying to minimize the amount of time I spend in this mutex. And one one of the things I know is super fast is I can take this vector of vectors of unsigned cares with a whole bunch of screenshots. Usually one, maybe more if they've really been hammering the F12 key mm -hmm. um, to take a screenshot. And instead of like compressing one at a time and then returning when I'm all done compressing, which would be silly, um, I can take that whole vector of vectors and just swap it with my local vector of vectors. Got yeah. it. So, so you're getting it out of the locked sense. version and getting it into something that doesn't need to be locked because yeah. it's local. Yeah, exactly. And I can do that with just like three you know, pointer swaps because a vector swap is very fast. Uh. Um, and it's no accept. Um, so I'm not gonna, I don't need to worry about exceptions rampaging through. I'm just like, OK, I got it. I know there's stuff in there. I'm going to swap it. And I'm going to give Super safe. The, um, the shared vector an empty thing, because my I always empty out my local work. So I basically grab all the work I need. Uh, the shared vector is now empty and ready to be filled with more screenshots. Then I get out of that mutex as fast as possible. And once I've called ul.unlock, then I'm on my worker thread, and I can do whatever I want. And I don't need to worry about blocking the main thread, which is furiously rendering UI and doing physics and whatever. Um, and then I just I have see. a, this is ordinary application code at this point. Um, I iterate through my vector screenshots. I process them by compressing and writing to disk. Um, and I do have one extra bit in here, because I do want to shut down my program eventually. Mm -hmm. I've got another function that if it wants to tell this worker thread to shut down cleanly, um, it emplaces a special sentinel value into my vector vectors. And that's signaled by just having an empty screenshot buffer. So if I find one of these empty vectors, I'm like, oh, I'm all done. I can return and cleanly shut down my worker thread. And then my main thread will wait for that worker thread to finish. It'll cleanly shut down. Um, don't ever want fire and forget threads. Yeah, it's like, a recipe for pain. Yeah, like don't thread detach or anything. You actually do need synchronization with how your thread shut down if your program is intended to shut down. Um, some programs, like server programs, may be effectively immortal that they're going to run until you know their server goes down or something. But in this case, I actually do want my game to be able to exit. Uh, now I did mention I use an atomic. 
All right. This is because if I were um, using an ordinary variable, I would need to protect it with a mutex, and that would be kind of silly for something that's just like a count of screenshots. What I want to be able to do is when the user hits F12, I want to render something to the screen that says, you know, one screenshot waiting to be compressed. And if they really hammer it, I want it to say, you know, five screenshots waiting. Stop then, hammering. Yeah, or something. <laughs> you dork. Um, but I want that counter to be able to decrement as right. the worker thread is draining them. But I have no idea when that's going to happen. Only the worker thread can tell me. So here I've got a bit of information that I actually want to communicate back from the worker thread to the main thread. And otherwise, no communication happens in that direction. Uh, the worker thread receives screenshots, it compresses them, and it never tells the main thread anything. This is the Got one it. channel back. And I don't take any action based on this. I don't like delete resources or whatever. Um, all I do is I write a number to the screen. Um, so here I can actually use an atomic. Um, I initialize the atomic to zero whenever I am ready to put something into the screenshot queue. Even before I've actually sent it over to the worker thread, I increment this atomic variable. Because the screenshot is waiting to be processed. It just happens to be on the main thread. Right. And then whenever the worker thread here, once it finishes writing now the screenshot, it it can. I can decrement the atomic variable, signaling back to the main thread, which can then just do a read of the atomic variable, how many screenshots remain to be drained. So the what happens, uh, as far as the user is concerned, they can hammer F12. It'll say like seven screenshots waiting. Then if they ask the game to exit, that counter um, displayed on the screen will actually count down six, five, four, three, two, one until they're all written down to the disk, and then the game exits cleanly. So it's actually sort of a progress meter. Um, and this is done through just an atomic variable. Here I'm using a boost atomic. Stood atomic is the same interface. And the cool thing is that although on different platforms, I would need different special operations. Like on Windows, it would be an interlock decrement. On POSIX, sure. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> and it really, really differs between processors. Like the code for x86 is totally different than the code for like ARM64. Um, but here with atomic. Which is the beauty of the SEO. Yeah, I can just say today. minus, minus, you know, M atomic remaining. And atomic only provides overloaded operators that directly map to atomic operations. Um, and in this case, I can decrement, and later on I can say load, and that will read it. Um, and that's all that I do. I, you know, I increment, I decrement, I load, and that's it. So the reading side just reads like once per frame. Yeah, whenever it needs to render a frame, okay. it loads how many screenshots are remaining. And if that number is non-zero, it uses font machinery to draw you know, five screenshots sure. remaining. Otherwise, it does nothing. Yep. Um, and no other action happens based on this atomic. So I don't need to worry about, oh, how is this atomic interacting with the mutex and condition mm -hmm. variable? It's a completely independent channel of communication. If I were doing anything else, I would want it to be protected by the same mutex. Yes. Uh, but in this case, I don't need that. So here I felt there was a compelling reason to use an atomic and a mutex and a condition variable. And this might occur in other contexts, too. Um, but that's yep. what the sort of example I wanted to show. All right, cool example. So we got just a couple more things we want to cover. So let's talk about uh, since there's like the many different types of mutis, mutices, mutexes, <laughs> mut, mutisexes. What? I don't. Um, this is going badly. Well, <laughs> you say that, but we actually don't know what to call them either in our code. Anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there are there's mutex, uh, recursive mutex, which is a mutex that you can call lock on multiple times and unlock on multiple times. From so a long single as, thread. From a single thread, so long as the, the number matches. Yes. Yeah. Um, which is telling you that you probably should, that you probably have a code smell, but there are things in the world that need recursive mutexes. It was um, considered important enough to standardize, so. Yes. You know, the standard passes no moral judgment necessarily on the character programs written with it. Yes. You can have very good programmers using vector, very bad programmers using forward list. The standard doesn't care. Yes. Well, I, I'm just saying, like, you really want to use mutex. You want to try very hard to use plain mutex. But there's also recursive mutex. There's timed mutex, which is the same as mutex, but you can try to acquire it for a certain amount of time. So like, so it's if, got a timeout? Is that basically what yes, it is? Yes. Like if I can't acquire this mutex in one second, then I didn't really want it anyways. Yeah. yeah. And you can also do try lock until, which is an absolute time, which is also kind of squirrely. Yes. Standard um, lets you do it. There's recursive timed mutex, which is take those two things and combine them. So it's a timed mutex that you can require, require recursively. I call that one guaranteed employment for standard library implements. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there are the, uh, the two other weird ones, which are shared mutex and shared timed mutex. And Those are new. Those were added to CS plus 17, I believe. I have, I'm not sure. Actually, I, I think I one thought was 14, and the untimed version was 17. Okay. That sounds right. Well, we'll yeah. check the I, internet I forget, because I don't actually <laughs> care about the international standard. I only care about the working paper, the latest one that's been voted in. Yes. I literally don't care about what was in C++ 14, unless I'm trying to implement you know, a switch that switches between the modes. Yes. That's why I'm fuzzy on when But do we have, like, like, mostly we're talking about not implementation-specific things, but do we have that one? 
So we have that one if you don't care about Windows XP. Um, so okay. we map that directly to the Windows underlying primitive SRW lock, which is a shared reader-writer lock, which is what shared mutex is. Um, basically, it's a way of saying, I can have any number of readers having concurrent access to this thing, but if there's one writer, then there can be no readers, basically. Yeah, and this it. happens a lot of times, like a resource that is frequently read but infrequently updated. Yes. A reader-writer lock is very suited to this sort of thing. And it yes. comes with its own II object shared lock, um, which is self-explanatory once you start using one of these things. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's also uh, cool to note that actually we proposed shared undetimed mutex. The original one in the standard was shared timed mutex. And then uh, Goran Nishanov, who uh, works on the libraries team, looked at that and was like, hey, we got this SRW lock thing in Windows. It can be more efficient if you only had an untimed version. And we made a convincing case to the standardization committee that actually turned out to apply to other platforms too. It's not just cool. Windows. Um, so yes. that's where that shared untimed mutex, more than just shared underscore mutex, came in. It's if you don't need the power of timing functionality, you can get a more efficient version. Um, otherwise, everybody would use shared time mutex because it's strictly more powerful. But if you don't need that timing functionality, you get more something efficiency. that's yeah, faster. Sweet. And it should be noted that before you break out the shared timed or the shared or shared timed functionality, you should profile your code and make sure that it, it's actually a win for you because shared time mutex is implemented under the covers as lock a plain mutex and do some bookkeeping. Yeah. So well, multiple it, condition variables sometimes. Yes. <laughs> so if the thing that you're locking is if the if the critical region that you're locking is cheap, then you're probably actually going to be happier with plain mutex. But again, profilers will will tell you what the right answer is. So what else do we want to share with folks before we wrap up for the day? I would say multi-threading programming is hard. Like, do yes. not treat it lightly. Yes. <laughs> I see. I, I see people just getting into it. Like, oh, I've got a thread. I'm just going to access some stuff. I'm going to throw a mutex condition variable. There's something yes. that. Even more so than ordinary programming, you really need to sit down and say, OK, I'm going to assume my program is going to crash and corrupt data horribly unless I do the exact right sequence of things. Then you need to figure out how to guarantee correctness. Yes. So basically, just you need, it, like, before you decide to embark on this journey of threads <laughs> and mutexes, you should profile your code and make sure that this is going to actually be a win for you. Um, mm -hmm. And there are a lot of great scenarios for this. Um, yeah, the two scenarios tend to be either I need stuff to happen really fast, like I want throughput, compress a whole bunch of data or whatever, yep. or sometimes I need things to not block another thread. And this usually occurs in UI threads. Yes. Yes. UI I don't actually need like all this stuff to happen super fast. I just need one thread to be able to constantly do things and be responsive. Um, and that's what thread and mutex and condition variable let you do. They don't sort of pass judgment on that. We've yes. got other things um, uh, like future async, um, that are higher level abstractions, but generally somebody should at least be familiar with how to write multi-threaded code with the primitives before they start using the higher level things, I would say. Um, maybe I'm too much focused on the fundamentals. <laughs> would you say that people should just run in and use async and future and the um, level things first? Well, or? I'm biased because I just rewrote async, so, <laughs> right? so I, I want people to use it, but maybe some... We can have that discussion another time. But indeed, maybe, maybe what we'll do is, I, I think, uh, assuming you know, we would love some feedback on this episode. We were hoping that this was very educational and that you learned a lot. Um, and our default answer is, is that if you think so, uh, we'll make a multi-threading part two that would yes. include things like future and async. And, yeah. and the parallelism library, which was just voted into C++ 17, which uh, we had a pro prototype implementation That's right. Of. Microsoft also has its dirty fingers all over. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> all right. Yes. Um, so yeah, let us know. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.